Hello, friends. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good morning, friends. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. How is everybody today? Nice. Hope you find yourself well on this day. Good morning to you. Hey, Karen, good morning. Rosalia, good morning to you. I hope you're well. How is everybody this morning? Things are beautiful and good where you are. Kristen, good morning. It's so wonderful to see you this weekend. You and you and your mom are both looking great. I'm so glad that uh, things are, things things seem good. So I'm so glad. I hope that's true. So, um, good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. Hey, John, good morning to you. Hope you're doing all right. Hello, everybody. Donna, good morning. Glad you're here. Hope that things are going well on your end. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Pat, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So it is such a joy that uh, you are here this morning and that you're with us and spending a little time on this, the 24th day of May at 1111. And I'm glad you're with us and you're glad a part of this journey that, uh, that we might come together for a few minutes and simply just be together, if nothing else. Just have other people on the stream, or if you're catching it later, that uh, that know that there's this little community that gathers that uh, you get to be a part of and be with. And so, welcome today. This uh, this morning, I want to talk about this uh, this kind of semi-famous um, quote from uh, from Romans. It's Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And so he's trying to he's trying to kind of empathize with them and trying to get them to to kind of you know you know kind of um, kind of hold the line. There are so many competing factors that are going on in Rome. It's so hard. Um, it, they're they're surrounded by so much difficulty. The church this church is, and you know it, they're in Rome. Can you know consider it that? Um, and and so he's trying to give them this encouragement. And so from the seventh chapter. He writes this. He says, and and he's, he's trying to lay out kind of how we are as people, and um, and they're under and understanding that. I do not understand what I do, writes Paul. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sinful living in me. For I know the, the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Paul is talking about, and to this church in Rome who's kind of conflicted and confected with all these kind of things that they want or, or and all the different wants of the world of Rome. I mean, you can imagine that uh, this is the center of the universe, the most opulent, most beautiful. It is a, a, a most permissive place in the world. It is a place 
filled with want, if you get my meaning, on every level of being. And this idea of, and so he, so he, he, he's entering into this with them and saying, look, I get it. We are in this world of want. And, and yet, and yet he's laying out, I think, one of the, one of the, just the basic foundational principles. You know, I, uh, on Sunday, I, I would talk a little bit about, you know, kind of how I'm not a Buddhist. Um, and, you know, but, and, and that's not to say, you know, you know, the Buddhists are horrible people or Jesus doesn't love them or anything like that. But it but it is to say that, that you know, that because we're speaking into this idea of desire, of want, and that the first rule of Buddhism is kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, um, all, you know, all desire is suffering. All, you know, all, all life is suffering. And so that desire brings nothing but suffering. And so there's this and and so they're they're not necessarily wrong on that, and they're you know it's just their answer that I have some questions about. But 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 they identify the problem correctly in some ways because this this notion of of what we really believe in 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 the West in the world that that freedom and and our ability to be free actually is the thing that will bring us to some joy that will bring us to some happiness that it, and being oppressed having you know, an iron fist or an iron hand on our life, being controlled by other people, being controlled by another, being uh, uh, not having the the ability to explore and experiment and be the person that we are meant to be, that's bad. And so that I linked into this whole thing of wanting is our freedom, is our nature of of are we free people? But that the, but that's not an external thing. It's an internal thing. And, and because what we discover, if we're really honest, is that is, is exactly what Paul is trying to lay out to the church in Rome, is that if we're in the business of always doing what we want, we're not in the business of being free. We're actually quite the opposite. That, that having to do what we desire Having to fulfill our desires at all time is not an image of of joy. It's an image of slavery. I mean, in in its worst incarnations, this is what we talk about when we talk about the passions and people being submitted and opened and uh, and surrounded by the passions. People who fall into addiction are people who are compelled to do what they want. That they that they can't not do what they want. People in, who are enraged and lose control and end up end up doing things that they that they that 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 uh, that even in the midst of their passions that they want to do, but they don't want to. But ultimately, that's not the world that they want to live. That what we understand is that if actually we think, and and we think this all the time, like it, it's really a, a a a huge little lie that we walk through our world with this notion that you know if I could just get what I want. If I or if I got what I want, if I and if I could just do what I wanted all the time, then that would lead me to joy and to happiness, and and ultimately, like if I was truly free to do all the things that I wanted to do. And what Paul is speaking into this is true is is that the reality is it's our wants that are at the far, that end up enslaving us far more than they end up setting us free. And even in the midst of all of these, this notion of our own freedom, well, like there's a lot of things we aren't free to do. I'm not free to sprout wings and fly around the room. That that uh, that there's a whole there's a whole category of things in which we simply aren't possible for us. And yet, in sandwiched in here, we still have this this nagging belief that if we could just pull off uh, getting through the day doing the things we wanted to do. Just really wanted to do that. You know, if we just gave ourselves over to our wants, we somehow would find ourselves in some joy. We would somehow find ourselves in the in the place of following our bliss and just ensuring that it taught it took us to the place of of wonder and goodness. And the reality is that's not how it works. That's not how it it opens to us. That not how that's not how God's grace actually comes to us. And this is kind of the you know the difference between our good Buddhist friends and 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 uh, and Christianity is that the invitation is not for us to want the things that we want because we understand that our wants are 
problematic right out of the gate, or at least we should understand that. It really is. And, and because, but, you know, we got a whole world that's telling us to, you know, to to encounter our wants, you know, and to give ourselves over to our wants, you know, it makes us good consumers. It makes us, it makes us, uh, it, you know, uh, um, you know, giving uh, giving over to all the different passions of the world. It makes us, you know, good good political actors. We get activists. We get what we want. You know, make sure that things happen. So what's the what? what so what does real freedom then look like? If it doesn't look like what I want, like this is this, I think is the note that that uh, that Paul uh, leaves us on is that if if I have this stuff in me, if I have or at least working through me these these desires that are just not going to take me to the thing, my my desire to eat all the brownies all the time, my you know my desire to to uh, you know you know, knock it off the couch when I, when there are things to be done and there are places to go, you know, my, you know, all of the different passions and all the different things that we talk about that all of these wants that we imagine ourselves to, would bring us to happiness, actually bring us to destruction. So when, what then are we to do? What then is the answer? I, I think the suggestion becomes, uh, is that, is not in the freedom of being the uh, of doing all the things that we want in our desire, all the desires that we have, acting all the desires out. That's not the path towards any kind of joy, helpfulness, happiness. It's actually our path towards our towards our brokenness. But this is what the image of Christ offers us, and it's what the whole idea of of being of being remade as a new person in Christ means. And and uh, you know and and I and and I hope you can hear this on a on the on the depth of level that I'm that I'm trying to that I'm trying to lean into, because it's not that we are that that when we begin to walk not in the way of our own wants, not in the way of our own, and not in the way of the law. This is the thing. This is the, I mean, the, you know, uh, Paul admits it to a, to a degree where he said, the law is good if it kind of keeps me out of trouble, but the law is not the answer. Like just whipping yourself with the flail, and we've all done this plenty, that, you know, convincing ourselves that, that you know, we're bad if we do this, we're horrible if we do that. That that doesn't that that there's not enough stick, there's not enough pain, to convince us that we uh, that that or to convince our wants that we should be other. Um, the the question becomes, how then are we to live, if we kind of this this kind of bill of goods that we've been sold over time, that our wants. All our little desires in there, getting them all met, getting all the shiny things, get all the lollipops and the fancy pants that we think we want in the course of life. How then do we live? Well, the, Jesus comes into the world. God comes into the world in order to show, to give us a path to reconnect to the really real. Because here's the thing about our wants, and here's the thing about true freedom is that they're not really real. Like, I can want a sandwich one day, and I can not want a sandwich another day. I, I can want this. I can, that they are mercurial. They change quickly. They, uh, they uh, evolve quickly. And they're phantasms. That we have a want, oh, I need this. And then we recognize that we, maybe we don't need that. that there's a way in which, which they, they simply... They simply change. They're they're not they're not real, and this is the thing: is what God calls us. What what Jesus came into the world to do. What God calls us to do as we walk in this way is to make real the things of our life, to make them really real. To take and this is the the difference in the law. To think to take this notion of the law that we have, like don't do that, don't do this. Do you know? You know, sit up straight, eat your peas, all that, all those, all those, 
the rules that the Israelites were given and all the rules that, that we have for ourselves, and I bet you have a bunch in your own head that that uh, going on about how you're supposed to be as a as a man, woman, lawyer, doctor, Indian chief, whatever whatever roles you play in the world, we, we all have these. And they set us up, that, that law, these roles, set us up for... Ending for kind of getting into bringing a knife to a gunfight when it comes to our wants. Because the thing about our wants is they are relentless, even though they're not real. They're pretty constant. They're pretty, they're that, the, that, you know, the one of the ways to, one of the ways Paul translates, uh, or, or Paul's idea of sinfulness gets pre- trans- translated is in the flesh. That this, that the 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 desires of this world, this sort of stuff, but they all aren't what really matter. What matters is the love between us. What matters is the caring. That that what matters is our our usefulness in the world, our ability to help, and our ability to build, and our ability to 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 bring things into being. What what matters is our ability to be a, a vessel of God's love that would flow into us. What what matters is is our ability to, to live into the really real, to live into the logos of our life. And so that the law stops looking like when we walk in the way of Christ and when we walk in the, when we start to follow so when we start to give these wants over to Christ. We start to give the give these things over to God and we start saying, Okay, Lord what do you want for me? What's what's a better what's what's a better thing than just this thing that I keep at, that I keep wanting for that I keep asking for? What's a better result? And what we begin to discover is if we take the law that that Paul talks about, what we begin to discover is that the law. Let's let's take for instance the Ten Commandments. The law stops being commandments, stops being these ways of do this or I'm going to get you kind of things. Do you know? Don't kill. Don't you know? Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't covet. Like these these ways, these ethical ways of being, stop being commands. I mean, and the law's all right if it's what we need. Like, don't do that. Okay, I won't do that. It can keep us out of trouble, but it can't get us across the river. What actually delivers us into the peaceable kingdom, what actually brings us into joy is our willingness to follow Christ and that in our following, that in our walking out of this image and this way that God gives us to be in this world, in our in our offering up, you know, when we get a big fat want, it's like, okay, I... You know, we can we can go through the very litany of what Paul says, or uh, of you know the very thing that I want, I I I cannot do the very thing that I that I do not want. I do. We can step into that, or or we can offer that up and say, okay, Lord, what do we want to do with what what do we do with this? And simply continue to walk out our path as it's illuminated in front of us. Sometimes we'll succumb to our want sometimes we'll you know god will help us shelve that and and create some space for something new and better and more beautiful but it's not about us getting it right it's about our willingness to keep walking in relationship with christ to keep walking into this relationship and that what we discover is those commandments that we that we thought were this iron rod held over our head that is going to whack us at any point that we stop by uh, you know, you know, being a good little boy or a good little girl, so we that we stop, you know, being the you know the man we're supposed to be or the woman that we're supposed to be. That when we if we take ourselves off that hook, because again, that's just again what our Buddhist friends get right is that's just another want, that's just another desire. But if we get ourselves into relationship with the one who made us. And that we start to walk out our lives in that relationship. What we begin to discover about the commandments is that they become promises. Don't kill. Don't have your heart filled with rage in such a way that you want to destroy somebody else. And Jesus' hand on our lives says, don't worry, you won't. 
don't worry, you're not going to be eaten by that, by that rage or by that, that destruction. Don't covet. Don't worry. You won't. You might see the shiny thing, but you're not going to be overtaken from it because I've got you. This is the promise of what real freedom looks like. It's not, it's not like, you know, uh, you know, Roosevelt's great invitation of, you know, the, the four freedoms and one of them being the freedom from want, which I don't even understand what that is. But this, this, you know, the idea that you're not going to be hungry at one point, I guess, but that doesn't even make any sense really as a, as a, as a construction, but that the freedom from, but that, but that in our wanting Christ brings us to that, which is really real, that which is really true, the things that matter in life and the things that will matter into eternity. It's not about whether or not we eat the 18 brownies or not. It's not even with, but it's, it, but it is our willingness to stay in, in relationship and to continue to walk that relationship out with God again and again and again with all of our falling downs and with all of our getting up with all of our destroy all of our trying to destroy ourselves and with all of our doing that which we desire not to do and not doing that which we desire to do with all of that the God's love and God's grace is is here to continue to guide us home if we but stay in relationship with him, if we just keep the conversation going, if we but keep our, keep our minds open, our hearts open enough so that in the midst of all the wants that fly in, in the midst of all the wanting and the not wanting, in the midst of all the getting it right and the getting it wrong, we don't come down with the hammer of judgment upon our heads and cast into the outer darkness we we but we continue to walk and stay in relationship with with Christ who came into this world for us true freedom is not going back to the garden and eating the apple or eating you know is is not the knowledge of good and evil that is not true freedom that is actually what has captivated that and catalyzed the hiding of humanity from everyone and from each other and from God himself. That the whole, the whole story of the, that, that takes us all the way back, right to the beginning of Bible, that all of it is right in there in the hiding of us from God. We hide... When the when when uh, Adam eats the apple or Adam eats the fruit and their eyes are open, they're, they the first thing they do is hide from God, and it's that is the that and that is what ultimately all of our wants. Well, I want to see what that is. I want to do that thing. All of our wants, all of our desiring, ends up in this place where we we end up essentially hiding from God. But when we bring our wants to the one who made us, when we walk in the garden in the cool of day, as, the, as, the, as was the, uh, the, the great invitation to Adam and Eve every day to walk with God in the garden in the cool of the day, when we seek to walk with God, we seek to walk in the way that Christ has laid out for us, when we seek to to lay out all of this, all of the stuff, all of the wants that are on board within us, when we lay them out and and give them to the to God Himself, whether we get it right that day or whether we get it wrong that day, the long arc of the universe, the long arc of our journey with God, is the place of promise. The place where we're not ruled by by iron law, and we just beat ourselves up because we're not perfect. Then, and we are, and where where we're where we're lifted out of all of the compulsion of our wanting that Paul is talking about when he's speaking to the church in Rome. But we come to the place where we simply dwell with the one who made us. 
the great poet Rumi put it this way. He said, there is a field beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing. I will meet you there. God's desire for us is to is to meet in a field beyond the ideas of like getting it all right or getting it all wrong, but it's staying in relationship with him. And in that relationship, we will find our way we, and God will God will protect us from the very wants of our heart that will destroy us. And that doesn't mean it'll ha- we'll do it perfectly. It'll happen all the time. This is a lifelong process and it is a lifelong relationship. But it's my hope for you that you will step into the true freedom of, of this relationship, of this desiring to simply, rather than, rather than get hung up on all the things that we want, offer those wants up. Offer those wants up to God and see what he'll do with them. He'll, let the, he'll prune away the ones that have no use and he'll open in our hearts the ones that are truly eternal that will bring us to the really real, to the logos of the universe and of our lives, to the ones that will turn all of our perfectionism and all our commands and all of our shame and all of our doubt into the promise of how we might be in the heavenly kingdom. All right, friends, this is my hope for you today. I hope it's, uh, I hope it's a good deal. Um, I hope everyone is well. Oh, Donna, goodness gracious. That's a lot. I hope uh, I hope all that goes uh, goes well in these days, and that um, that you might know some of the pro- the promise of uh, true freedom. All right, friends. I will we'll pick it up tomorrow with another eleven eleven.